<laughs> well, this started off strangely fast. Over a decade ago, the Xbox Indie Game Store was a bastion for cheap and, subjectively speaking, fun games. A lot of classics were born there, and eventually grew popular outside of the Xbox marketplace. Which is good, because Microsoft shot down services for the Indie Game Store for the 360 back in 2017. While you can still play the games provided you purchased it, the games themselves are no longer available to purchase, with a YouTube channel preserving gameplay of each title as a way to catalog history. The Indie Game Store itself didn't really have a lot of quality control either. Sometimes it felt like people were just trying to cash in a quick buck, depending on what the trend or meme was. But for others, this marketplace provided genres that the Xbox was lacking. Breath of Death and Cthulhu Saves the World, for example, definitely filled the void for the JRPG market, and went on to become quite successful when they transitioned over to Steam. Also, quick fact, Z-Boy Games, the developers, would later go on to hire Hyperduck Studios, who also composed the music for Remar's cult hit, Iggy. Just a silly little coincidence that made my day when I found out, you know, I've heard about this stuff. Anyways, not every game moved on to other platforms, and some gems remain unobtainable, playable only to those who have already purchased them when they had the chance long ago. So today, I just wanted to list my three favorite indie games from my own collection that you can't play anywhere else. Okay, I might be cheating by including an entire series that spans across four games, but let me explain. Decay is a point-and-click horror game that at the time was pretty popular and was often seen in the top games when browsing for indie titles. You play as some guy with convenient amnesia who attempted suicide, only to be brought back to life from some unknown forces and... That's all you know at the start. Newspapers and notes are scattered to give background to your character, and you come across news stories of accidents and murderers. There are also portraits of the mysterious Mr. O. White, haunting you with his murderous gaze in different places. You also have these creepy dolls helping you out along the way, and they leave trails to hint to the next location or give items to solve puzzles. While most probably won't find it scary, it does nail the aesthetics quite nicely, and with a nice soundtrack to boot. Also, it doesn't really rely on those overused jump scares. Too much, at least. It can be a little dark too as well, so it makes exploring a little harder when you're trying to figure out what else to do. It's also pretty cryptic, but that's part of the course when it comes to point and click games. Hints are very subtle, and some may even include examining the many objects you collect. Despite that, it has a few clever puzzles. And tic-tac-toe along with a simple breakout game, I guess. Pro tip, if you go second, always go for the center, to at least tie the game. The game's and story does develop later on in the titles, and while the first two were available for a dollar due to their very short nature, parts 3 and 4 does enhance the scope of the game with new locations to explore. They even offer collectibles along the way, and alternate endings to encourage multiple playthroughs. Shiny Game Software even published a successor entitled Decay of the Mare. I remember randomly coming across it on the Google Play Store, and playing the first two titles. I waited years for the sequel, only to notice that they quietly released the whole package on Steam, which is a direct mobile port so it causes some resolution issues. Besides the Decay series, it also appears they help with DICE, with some coding for popular titles. While Decay of the Mare may be available on Steam and phones, their original work remains on the Xbox Indie Store, only to be a faint fond memory for those who are willing to pay them the price of a large coffee to experience a series of memorable games. Alright, this one shouldn't be a surprise for most. It's the twin-stick zombie shooting game that costs a dollar, and the dev hopes you pay for it. There really isn't much to say about this game besides the fact that it's incredibly fun, supports up to four players, and has a kick-ass soundtrack played throughout the entirety of the game. It's only a single stage, but it's a long one that progressively gets harder. Plus, you have limited lives, so if you die too much, game over. Enemies occasionally drop weapons or power-ups that helps you mold them down faster. The stage also transitions to different backgrounds as the music changes, and spawns unique enemies depending on the current theme. With each new background, new enemies pop up, and the screen can get too exciting with the flashing images in your face, causing some unfair deaths. At the end, it becomes a final Hail Mary where every single enemy variant shows up, and you pray you can get to the rocket or spreadshot or something to take out the hordes. As the song mentions, it only costs a dollar, 
and went on to become one of the most wildly successful indie games on the market. The song can even be downloaded and played on the Xbox's version of Rock Band. The developers, Ska Studios, will later go on to make some pretty awesome games, like the Dishwasher series and Sultan Sanctuary. While I haven't played the latter myself, I did play the Dishwasher Vampire Smile and couldn't help but smile myself when I saw that billboard. While rumors of a port date all the way back to 2014, and that's putting it loosely, the game is still in limbo. Visiting Ska Studios' site now shows a list of indie games that have been delisted and no longer available. I'll admit, I saw some of these games being advertised, but I never knew it was made by Ska Studios. Now that I know that, I kind of want to try them out, but now the only way to play them is having already purchased a copy, or have a friend that did, since the marketplace has been locked off. Oh boy, if you know this game, you know how fun this title is. I remember seeing the title I couldn't even read and looking at the gameplay before instantly saying, yup, this is for me. It's a 4-player arcade-style beat-em-up hack-and-slash tower defense game with RPG elements. Yes. The game can be best summarized as an 8-bit Dynasty Warriors with some tower defense mechanics. You go through the game defending the princess that stands in the center from the upcoming enemies. She gives you hearts when you perform combos, which work as both currency and experience points. You can spend them to upgrade your barriers and eventually turn them into catapults. You can use these catapults to lodge boulders at swarms of enemies. You can also hold the attack button to charge up a powerful attack, but the more you use it, the more hearts it costs. And there are tons of enemies in here. It's easy to get lost in the action as harder difficulties spawn more, tougher enemies. Large bosses come in too at the end, so if you're not careful, they will ruin your day. If the princess starts taking damage, you can move her out of harm's way. You can even bring her all the way to the bottom of the screen for a magical flying dude to come in and heal her for some of her HP. At the end of the stage, the remaining barriers are tallied up into hearts, which you can spend on upgrades. Each upgrade gives different buffs depending on which class you picked. Of course you have your standard warrior that tosses hatchets and enhances combos. His upgrades give him more tornado. The wizard gets more powerful spells and eventually upgrades the flamethrower to a hell thrower. The eccentric ninja can distract enemies with a mannequin of the princess. It has a chance of becoming more alluring, so that more enemies can be baited in for an explosion. And the Amazon, who upgrades involve becoming progressively more anorexic. Yeah, this joke didn't age too well. Also an added note, I came across a video upon doing research, an NES homebrew game was actually made starring the Amazon, where you run, avoiding cake icons and trying to stay hydrated. Neat. You don't lose upon dying, but you do lose hearts. It's not until the princess takes too much damage do you get a game over. However, it's not the end of the world. You're instantly able to try again from the same stage, allowing you to try out different strategies. Do you try to take out the hordes with what little fortitude you started with so you can maximize potential upgrades? Or do you give yourself an easier time by building a fortress of a defense so you can take out the enemies at your leisure? Solo, the game is alright, but with friends it's instantly tons more fun and the different classes and upgrade does add to its replay value. And there's a nice charm to having everything translated in English. While the game is sadly no longer available, there is a sequel, on the 3DS. God of Protectors in many ways builds upon the first and does so better. New classes, new upgrades, many more stages, and a humorous story to boot. There's even a stage editor so you can build your own crazy stages. Unlike the first, upgrades are self-contained within each run and go away once you start a new run. But in this title, your classes actually stick with the upgrades. This is subjectively better or worse, however, as the fun of replaying the game was the fact that you can try out different upgrades on the fly and power up equally with your friends. In the sequel, however, you need both money and loot, with each enemy having their own drop table. And of course, the better upgrades require more rare loot, so it creates this monotonous grind where you're retrying the same stage again and again, trying to get a rare drop. And if you do have friends, it's most likely you all have different levels and upgrades, so it's harder to pick a stage that's balanced for all of you. But that's just a minor offense. The game does support local wireless play, so if you have the chance, I strongly recommend you try it out. Maybe get some friends to try it out and blow the dust off those 3DSs before its eShop inevitably gets pulled down. And hey, upon research, I stumbled upon an article that announced a sequel for the Switch. It's only for Japan currently, and still not out. But I do hope it comes to the West. And there you have it. I'm sure there are other gems out there that I missed, 
but with the store down, it's become impossible to give them a try. It kind of sucks knowing that we're living in an age where certain games we've enjoyed are slowly becoming more and more difficult to preserve. So I just wanted to talk about these games as a bit of a nostalgia trip so they won't be completely forgotten. Well anyways, if you like what you watched and want to help this small channel grow, you can help me out by giving me a subscribe if you haven't and sharing this video. I'd really appreciate any little exposure I can get. For now, why don't you check out these other videos if you haven't? And next up on my to-do list is a video comparing two indie games mostly made by a single dev and game maker. That's right, I'm going to go through the similarities and differences between Edgy and Undertale. See ya!